Hi, everyone. Welcome. And we, we're so excited to see, see you all here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, my name is Sunny Ra, Manager of School and Teacher Programs here at TAM. And we're excited uh, that you're here for the Departure and Divisions Curators Talk, which is now on view. Oh, can everyone hear us now? Uh, let us know. We'll monitor the chats for any questions. Um, so Departures and Divisions are now on view at TAM, so please come see us. First, we would like to acknowledge that TAM is located on the homelands of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. We recognize and honor the people, the Puyallup people and the Coast Salish communities who speak the Lushootsee language. For our talk today, I'd like to introduce David Setford, TAM's Executive Director and Curator of Departures and Divisions, Variation in American Styles from 1900 to 1950, in conversation with Margaret Bullock, Chief Curators. If you have any questions, please save them for after the chat. There'll be a short uh, Q&A. Um, and without further ado, David and Margaret, thanks again and enjoy. Thank you, Sunny. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for your patience. We're just letting um, a couple other people uh, join us. And um, we'll try and keep an eye on Q&A and chat, but definitely we'll round back to questions at the end here, as Sunny was saying. So. Um, today, I get to have the great fun of not actually having to be the main speaker for a program and just ask David a lot of questions. So our format is I'm going to ask him some questions. Um, we're going to look at some images and talk about them as we go, and then we'll save some time to answer your questions if you have them. So, so David, my first question for you is why did you choose this theme for the exhibition? Thank you, Margaret, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, well, the this period in Europe and, and America is my favorite period, this turn of the century to about 1945 to 1950. And when I started looking at the American collections, um, on, you started showing me the American collections at, at TAM, which aren't usually on, uh, in display, uh, on display. Um, I was trying to find out a way to, 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 to fit them into an exhibition. And, the impressionism show that we did a couple of couple of years ago was much more easy because there was a much greater band of impressionism that we had in the collection to build the to build the exhibition on. The American uh, collection, uh, there's a lot of really good examples from different periods and from different sc schools, um, but there wasn't really enough of of, of any of the any of them to to build a show. And then I was really struck by the difference between the early work and the, again about how much um, American art changed in this period. So it seemed to me a really good idea to talk about those different schools that, that, that brought about those changes, how they came about um, and why they were important. Um, and as I say, the show goes from around 1900 to around, uh, around 1950, and the massive changes in American art during that period. Yeah, it's interesting that collection came to the museum almost mostly in the 1970s. And there were two women in particular here in Tacoma, um, Mrs. Murray and Mrs. Warner, who were really interested in what was then contemporary American art. And they, they um, provided money to the museum to buy a few works here and there. And then um, we'll talk about the print collection a little bit later, but um, Carolyn Schneider uh, pulled together this collection of American prints and gave it to the museum. So it's, as you know, it's what we call one of our legacy collections. It's this small group of work that's just there in the collection. And it was, and it was a collection, it was a collection that, as I understand it, um, was really quite frequently featured in, uh, in the past uh, at TAM, maybe at the bank building or in, in, in other buildings that we had, along with the European show, uh, the European imp uh, Impressionism. But then as we developed and layered Northwest and glass um, and then Western art uh, on top of uh, to be part of our mission, they've been shown less and less. So really part of that, part of it desire was to actually bring out a collection that had some wonderful things in it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, it is one of those, is I, I know we use the uh, works periodically as like context for something, you know, like something will come into a portrait show, or if we're talking about a particular movement, we'll pull out a work, but it's really nice to have a moment to just celebrate these works um, individually. So, so and, and so it really starts with this whole 
premise that that in the late 19th century, American art, even for the time, was somewhat conservative. Um, copying the French Impressionists and really governed by the rules and principles of the National Academy of Design in New York, who had the major exhibitions that you had to jury into. And if you weren't uh, liked by the juryists, uh, you didn't get into the exhibitions. Um, and that, so th this whole thing started with a move away uh, from, from those influences, French Impressionism and the, uh, and the National Academy of Design, um, which is really a lot of what this show's about. Well, that's interesting because usually when we talk about French Impressionism, it's always as an avant-garde movement. It was a, and it was, it was obviously a real change. We all know that you know, in what was happening in the time, but here in the show, you're talking about it as conservative. And I think it would be really interesting to have you talk a little bit more about that for folks who are like, wait, wait, all the, every, um, every show I've ever seen on Impressionism talks about how it was this, this new thing and very kind of forward thinking. Well, it was. And in France, um, in, in the uh, Impressionism began to develop in the early 1860s in, 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 in France. And it was very radical. And it was radical partly because they started doing their own exhibitions and moving away from the Salon exhibitions. Uh, but it was also ra radical because influenced by the writings of Baudelaire, they were moving away uh, from you know, the, the most important type of uh, subject matter, according to the Salon, was history painting. Um, um, and then it went down a list, history painting um, and uh, landscape was, right, was at the bottom and portraiture was in the middle somewhere. But what the French Impressionists did, they went out and painted modern life, which was, which was huge, a huge advance uh, for, for, for the France in the 1860s and 1870s. But the modern life they painted was the modern life that they lived in. They painted the bourgeoisie and the, the upper levels of society. They painted cafes and bars with people in fine, fine clothes. Uh, they painted, you know, Dogat painted the ballet, which pretty much wasn't a working class thing that you could go to. Um, and so it was, it was a certain type of modern life. They didn't go out and paint the, the, the working class. They didn't go out and paint people, uh, poor, people uh, poor people on the streets or, or, or their homes. And that's the difference. That's what began to happen in America in the early 20th century. And that was radical for America. It was radical for any art anywhere that people would go out and start portraying a class of society that previously were deemed to be not worthy of being shown in high art. I'm going to bring up some slides so we can talk about some of those images. David, can you see those okay on your screen? I can. All right, I so can. if anybody, um, anybody that's uh, in our audience can't, is having an issue or uh, these aren't showing up right, please let me know um, if it's a general thing and we'll see if we can troubleshoot that. So can you talk a bit more about what you were just saying? Like, how do these subjects, how do these views of well, daily life differ? Yeah, um, and by the way, we don't own the George Bellows. I w wish that we did, um, but he's the, one of these artists that aren't in our collection, but we felt that it was a good idea to have it as a comparison. This change began to happen. Um, uh, a guy called uh, Robert Henry um, went to, Paris in uh, 1892 to study and spent two or three years in Paris and came back and started to teach. Um, came back and he was in Philadelphia uh, and he started to teach and he built up a young group of artists around him um, that included, uh, uh, that included uh, William Glackens, Everett Shin, um, uh, uh, George Lukes, um, and a couple of others. Um, and he began to, 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 to teach these artists to go out and look at what was happening in the streets around them. Those, those artists, apart from Henry, were all also newspaper illustrate, illustrators uh, and worked for the um, Philadelphia Press. 
because photography wasn't at that point photography was only just beginning to be used in newspapers so uh, artists drew reports of major fires or you know fights in the street or whatever was happening um, and then Henry uh, moved and started teaching in 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 New York in in 1900, 1900 at the uh, New York School of Art which used to had been called the Chase School before that, and began to get more and more of his uh, students to go out and paint, paint the streets and paint what was actually happening, what they actually saw um, in the streets. And it was really, a, really quite a radical thing. So the George Lukes, which is ours, and which I'm told is really one of the, the one on uh, your left as you're looking, um, is really one of the great favorites of this collection. Um, and it's a really sweet, sweet, portrait of a of a little boy in his I think woolly hat and his ears all covered up but this is a guy this is from a, a guy uh, this is a little boy from the lower east side that's where George Luke's got most of his subject matter and before before the turn of the century this is 1904 to 1906 so it's quite early in Luke's career um, that would uh, an immigrant would never have been the subject of a work of art in any type of exhibition or anything that an artist would 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 produce. Um, so this is it's a it, to today it looks a little chocolate boxy to us. It looks sweet, but it's hard to uh, uh, overestimate how images like this were different. Then you look at the George Bellows. Uh, George Bellows, as I say, we don't have in in the collection or the exhibition. This is one of his most important uh, early works, 42 Kids. Bellows was born in o Ohio, nearly became a basketball player, came to, came to uh, New York in 1901, um, and he, he, he joined uh, that school of art, the New York School of Art, where he was with Robert Henry. And Henry told him as other people to go out and work and look and, and, and make sketches and, uh, in the... Uh, in Manhattan. Bellows was a very tall character. He loved to walk. He spent most of his hours doing these long, long walks um, in, in New York City, up, up Riverside Park, through all the boroughs. Um, this painting is something he just saw and he made a quick sketch and he brought it back. But again, prior to, prior to this period, you would never have seen portraits of little boys bathing in the river, jumping off a raft or a pier um, in all their glory. Um, and it, it's, it's, an, it's actually an amazing painting um, that, that even at that period, somebody, somebody could, could do this um, uh, and, and take this as a subject uh, matter for a, for a, for a painting. Um, yeah, I think of- Bellows went on and didn't- Oops, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say that Bellas went on to do many, many more paintings in a similar style. Of course, we all know him for the boxing paintings, uh, which wouldn't have been subject matter for high art with the National Academy of Design either. But he also painted some fabulous uh, snow paintings of people out and about in the snow between 1905 and, and, and 1915. But they were... Bellows was probably the grittiest and the most realist in his subject matter uh, of all of these artists that in that period were called, began to be called the Ashcan School. And it's always fascinating to me. It's like, I think of people who had been going to galleries or going to exhibitions and seeing this very particular kind of work, you know, the, maybe it's a scene of, you know, nymphs in a forest or it's a beautiful sort of impressionist view of people at a cafe or some lovely woman in her garden and then you walk into a show and here's this big picture because I didn't put the bellows measurements on here but it's a big picture and a big picture of a bunch of naked little boys like swimming in a river um, that probably was not the cleanest so or this little boy um, on the or this little child I should say I don't know if it's a boy or girl on the left so it's a really interesting moment to kind of think about like what a shock that must have been to people and why that why the ash school yeah. Yeah, it's the East River. Yeah. The Ashcan School, well, 
Um, we, we mentioned that several of these artists, uh, John Sloan, Blackens, uh, William Blackens, Everett Shin, and George Lukes had worked for the Philadelphia Press. A couple of the others, George Bellows, for instance, and Arthur B. Davis, uh, had also worked for The Masses, which was a socialist uh, magazine published in, in New York. Um, they were very close. That was another reason why they were Bellows and, uh, and, they, uh, and John Sloan were painting realist subject matter, everyday life and, 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 and ordinary people. But it was actually the, uh, one of the editorial board of, the, uh, of that magazine, The Masses, a chap called Art Young, who is credited with first using the term Ashcan art because it, because, you know, I've never seen an Ashcan, by the way, in any of these paintings by the Ashcan school, but because it sort of encapsulated the, 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 the feeling of some of the works of art or, or the feelings of the types of things that they would portray. Kind of sooty, really. Sooty and gritty yeah. And, yeah. And, and maybe just a little bit dirty. I mean, dirty in a mucky sense, you know. Yeah. Perfect for Tacoma with its gritty city reputation. Gritty right? city, <laughs> yes. To have these questions, so I'm going to change the to a net to the next slide because um, which might take it a moment because my um, computer can be kind of slow with these, but um, there's a work by the artist Everett Shin in the exhibition um, that is up oh, there it is, and um, can you talk about this one for a second? I mean uh, we're talking about these street scenes and these sort of gritty scenes, but this one um, seems more like what you'd expect from a French impressionist. Yeah, it does. It's interesting. Um... Shin, as I said, was was working in Philadelphia for for the Philadelphia Press before before he came to Manhattan. Um, uh, and one of the things that he liked to do, he was really noted for his ability for his draftsmanship. Uh, one of the things he loved to do was to 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 go out and and for the newspaper show you know street fights and and violence and and. Uh, um, but the other thing that he did, started to do while he was in Philadelphia working for the paper was uh, do sketches which were then printed up in the paper uh, of um, openings at theatres um, and, and whoever it might be acting at, at whichever theatre it might be. And throughout his whole life, he, he continued to be a great proponent um, of... Uh, of these theater, theatrical subjects. Now, this isn't a theater, this is the ballet in Central Park, um, which is a sort of a, a, a somewhat of a democratic thing because at least it's outside in the park and it's a free ballet that everybody could, could, uh, could, come, and, could come and see. But I think really it was uh, what unified Shin, but also Ernest Lawson, um, uh, um, to, to the group that became known as the Ashcan School and, and then later exhibited in 1908 as the Eight, was this desire to have a place to exhibit. They, weren't, they didn't get into the, uh, the National Academy shows. This wasn't, this wasn't considered to be, you know, along the lines prescribed by the National Academy in terms of subject matter um, or indeed execution. So these artists, although three of them were really not quite Ashcan school artists in a sense, but they were a very strong group that were trying really hard to have a place to exhibit and to get away from the strictures laid down by the National Academy uh, of Design. That's an important point. I'm gonna change slides on you here, but I think it's an important point you know, when we talk about groups and give them names like that, we tend to kind of think of them as everybody's doing something similar or bouncing off the same ideas, which can be true. But for this group, it's really that that shared interest and that shared desire to have a new way of exhibiting and thinking about art. Yeah, it's not that yeah. they're trying to look all the same. Yeah, yeah. And so it was the to... same, as I said, with 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 Ernest Lawson and um and, and Arthur B. Davies, um, who, whose works are in this show. And this is the Arthur B. Davies, uh, which is a gorgeous early work by Davies. Um, 
And you look at it and you think, oh, it's more 19th century. It's maybe more like a symbolist painting from France. He became really well known for these uh, uh, sort of pastoral frieze-like uh, groups of women in, fr in front of a sort of fantasy dreamy landscape. And this is just a really, really lovely uh, example. Um, but Davis was really, really important in that desire to move away from the National Academy, which of course he didn't get into. Um, and indeed he was one of the people that organized the 1908 show at the Macbeth Gallery along with Robert Henry, which was the first time this group of artists under the name of the Eight uh, exhibited together and actually the last time they exhibited together. Um, but this was the first independent exhibition in America. And you remember, so in France, there would have been a lot of them. 1863, there'd been the Salon des Refusés, uh, and then the Salon of the Independence from 1864 onwards, and then the Salon d'Automne. So there were, by the end of the 60s in Paris, there were a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for artists to, to exhibit outside of the main Salon. And that there was one in England, uh, the, the uh, Roger Fry's Post-Impressionist uh, exhibition in 1911, which did the same sort of thing um, in, 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 uh, in England. Um, but the eight in 1908 at the Macbeth Gallery was the first, the first independent exhibition um, in, in, in America of a, of, a, of a group of artists and had a really important influence uh, in, uh, for the artists, but also in this period which culminated in 1913 with the Armory show uh, in New York City. Now, this work always reminds me of um, a Whistler or something, you know, that, that interest in those kind of really subtle tonal shifts. And, you know, there's that movement in this period of time uh, in American art that's really not that well known or focused on, but called tonalism, you know, that shows up in like yes, the 1890s. Yes into the early 1900s that's really interested in picking up that idea of whistlers and playing with these very subtle colors. But you mentioned well, the armory the, the show. Nocturne, yeah, the nocturne thing, very, 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 um, Oops. very whistlerian, but I also had looked at, um, Davis had also been influenced by uh, the French symbolist Puvis Chauvin and Odillon ah, Redon. So right. some of that influence was in there as well, yeah. Well, you mentioned the Armory Show, so um, let's talk about that because that is a really a watershed moment in American art. It was officially called the International Exhibition of Modern Art and it happened in 1913. Can you talk more about why it was important for American art and um, how it's reflected in these two examples that are both in the show? Well, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that was important about the Armory Show was that, and, and that it was organized actually pretty much by the eight, by the Ashkent School. So building out of their 1908 exhibition at the Macbeth Gallery, but this was a much bigger thing, which wasn't just American artists. It was, it was built as a, uh, an opportunity to show to artists and dealers and the general public what had been going on in Europe, as well as what was going on in America. And in fact, the biggest impact of, the, of it was what was going on in Europe. The, the symbol for the Armory Show was a pine tree, which had, had been abstracted or taken out of, of, of a Revolutionary War flag from the state of Massachusetts. So that they put that pine tree with its with its connotations to revolution as the logo for the show was like they were building this up to be something revolutionary in american art um, and the way people thought about art and the influence that it was going to have um, on artists and i think you all know the story or maybe some of you know the story of uh, the most the, the most remembered story about the uh, on display apart from 
many works by Matisse and Picasso, the Fauves, the Cubists, um, and even a few Impressionists, uh, was this amazing large work by Marcel Duchamp called The New Descending a Staircase, which caused a furore, um, and it was meant to. And it caused, caused a furore because people pretended that it was totally abstract and they couldn't see anything. And of course, it wasn't totally abstract. You just saw various different planes of a, ver of a figure in different uh, uh, poses descending a staircase. So it was like a sort of almost like freeze frame photography in a, in, in a sense. But the critics hated it. One of them called it an explosion uh, in a shingles factory which I always thought was really funny. Um, and then another one um, um, uh, equated it to a rush hour in the subway. Um, um, an, an amazing work of art. But that was the tenor. The tenor was almost to shock. Um, sometimes it was to shock, um, but sometimes it was just to really show things that, that, that had been happening in Europe for a while. Um, one of the things that came out of the Armoury show was probably, you could say that the Ashcan School and the Eight did things that hadn't been done uh, before in American art because of the subject matter. But there was, a, there was a group of artists influenced by Cubism in the, um, in the uh, Armoury show that developed this style called precisionism. Many people call that precisionism the first real American style. And, and indeed, um, that's one of the things we're looking for in the show, how Amer an American style or different succinctly, obviously um, pure American styles rather than European ones developed in this country. And so precisionism was obviously influenced by cubism and looking at geometric forms in industrial buildings, in farm buildings, in domestic buildings. And so the two artists that we're showing here, very, very divergent. Uh, Beulah Hyde uh, is a Tacoma gal, uh, came born in Kansas, but moved to Tacoma as a child. And she, she uh, attended the Annie Wright School um, and uh, she studied privately with Mark Toby. Um, she showed with the Tacoma Art League, which was the precursor to the Tacoma Art Museum. And indeed she was an early supporter of the Tacoma Art Museum. Um, but you see how she's really uh, cutting everything down to the bare minimum. Details, um, you know, gr gradations of color are all cut down. So basically what we're looking at are these geometric, geometric shapes. Um, it's almost like a it's almost like a Cezanne in in uh, in uh, 1955 in America. Now this is a long time after the Armory show, but that influence lasted for a long time. And and Tam has, I believe, three of these works by Beulah Hyde, which are which are really really incredible. Um, and then on the right, people don't think of Georgia Georgia O'Keeffe as a precisionist, but early early in her career. Um, along with uh, Demuth, Charles Demuth and Charles Sheila and one or two other people. Um, she was painting barns in uh, Bucks County um, and she was painting Manhattan and she was painting uh, architecture um, on the uh, at, uh, Alfred Stieglitz's compound on Lake George in New York. Um, and again, it's a, and, and this of course is, after she, she didn't move to New Mexico until the 30s. We always think of her as a New Mexican artist, but she had all that time in New York and uh, Manhattan and upstate New York before, before she even went to New Mexico for the first time in uh, 1929. But here she is in 1951. She'd bought the house in Abiquiu in uh, 1945. I, I, some of you may have been to the house in Abiquiu, which I'm lucky enough to be able to say I have. Um, there's a central courtyard with a doorway which led to a storage room, which was actually uh, at one point a granary, I guess. Um, and and the, the door is 
is is is reduced to this uh, rectangle of black, um, and the shadows and the colors basically just denote geometry, the geometry of the shadows and the geometry of the wall and the geometry of, of the front of the the patio uh, uh, floor and the shadows on the floor. So in that respect, she is sometimes called a precisionist because that was exactly what Demuth and Sheila and Beulah Hyde and other people um, uh, were also doing. Um, this is on loan to uh, to uh, Tam. We're really glad to have it on loan. Yeah, and we didn't put a slide in of her work, but we, well, when you come to see the show, there's this amazing Northwest precisionist artist named Vanessa Helder, um, who was a a watercolorist and could do incredible work with precisionism, those tight lines, those sharp angles, and yet um, with a medium that doesn't lend itself to it. So, yeah. interesting. But yeah. you know, so we've been talking. Really... Sorry, you and I've got a bit of delay. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say precisionism really just shows one of the influences of the uh, Armory show uh, on American artists. Others show and you'll see them in the exhibition, the influence of Fauvism or, or of Matisse or of various other people as well. Well, that's a great segue because that was my next question really is, I'm gonna change the slide on you here. So we've been talking about the, when this talk was um, publicized, you were talking about how this show is gonna talk about how Americans are trying to find their own style. But what we've been talking about now for a good 10 minutes is about all the influences coming from elsewhere. Um, and you look at the show and also like work coming, um, influences coming from Mexico, from Europe. Um, so what kind of work did American artists eventually land on um, to really call it an American style? What is it that they find finally that becomes unique? And um, I think, you know, that that is really um, American scene painting. Yeah, yeah. These three works might look superficially very different, but they're part of the same reaction. Um, they're part of this uh, continued espousal through the 30s of a realist type of, uh, more or less realist type of art in America. Um, and so the American scene uh, painters included regionalists uh, and social realists Sorry, I'm pointing at my screen, but you can't see what I'm pointing at. So regionalists like Thomas Hart Benton, um, social realists, you can say Jacob Lawrence was a social realist painter. I think that's accepted. And even Kenneth Callahan uh, in this instance. And what's lovely, by the way, about our collection is that we don't just have the national figures in here that, that, that denote these styles, but we have the regional figures as well. Um, so yeah, this, this um, this uh, American scene where people are looking around them at what's going on in the, uh, on the farms, in the cities, on the streets, is really important. And it is something that did filter on through the Ashcan school throughout American art through the, through the 30s, 40s and early 50s. Um, I adore this uh, Thomas Hart Benton Lonely Horse he, of course, was very much influenced by, he met Diego Rivera um, and, and some other Mexican muralists. And many of his, uh, many of his uh, best known works, of course, are big murals um, uh, uh, in Detroit, um, in San Francisco and, and, and other places. But here, um, you know, you look at his art, an easel painting, oil on masonite. And I can see, and many people have said that his, his easel painting, his small, smaller paintings are also directly influenced by that influence of, uh, um, of, uh, of those muralists. Um, and then Jacob Lawrence here. I was talking with Margaret earlier, um, wasn't I? And I was saying, I didn't realize quite, I mean, this is very early, it's 1936, but I didn't realize quite how early this was in Jacob Lawrence's career. And it was before uh, he worked for the Federal Art Project when he was working um, uh, with um, uh, Augusta Savage at the uh, Harlem Community Arts Center, uh, which he did from 1934 to 1936. So it's a really early uh, 
Jacob Lawrence, and we're incredibly lucky to have it um, at TAM. And of course, Lawrence is well known for this type of work of art, and, and his subject matter might, may have changed, but the, but but his technique and, and his composition really didn't. Of course, he's mainly known uh, for for those big series uh, that that he did, or most known for the big series he did, like the Migration series, which talked about the movement of African Americans from the South to the Industrial North in between 19, uh, 1900, I guess, and 1940, um, and the Toussaint Louverture series uh, uh, relating to Haiti. Um, but this one, really important, Street Orator's Audience in 1936. Yeah, and I wanted I mean, to... I love... Go on. I was just going to, you know, I, I was going to jump in on anything WPA, but um, you mentioned the Harlem Community Arts Center, um, and that was a federal art project during the New Deal and during the Depression. Um, that was an initiative that they established these community art centers, mostly in smaller communities that didn't have a lot of resources, but they also established a really important one at Harlem, and that's one of the few that has survived till today and is still active. But the centers were really these incredible opportunities for young artists who didn't have work, didn't have support, um, or who like um, Jacob, black artists, artists of other um, ethnicities, um, to get opportunities to actually be paid for their work. And so they were great launching centers for all sorts of important artists. So. Yeah. And of course, I, what I didn't mention with the Jacob Lawrence was this was the height of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, when Jacob Lawrence was painting and, and, and were starting his career in Harlem, um, which began this melting pot for, uh, for culture, mainly uh, African-American culture as all of those uh, folk moved north from, from, from the south and bought music and jazz and painting and quilting and all of those other cultural traditions uh, and photography to, uh, to, to Harlem. So I was gonna mention the Callahan, which, which I adore. Um, Callahan is one of the artists I've had the most joy uh, looking at in our collection because we have, well, we have a lot of Tobys too. A lot of them are on paper, uh, but we have quite a few Callahans too, a lot on paper. Um, and you can go to our uh, collection online and, 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 and look at them. Or you can look at all of these things on our collection online. Um, what, what, what amazes me about uh, Kenneth Callahan is that he was largely untaught. Um, um, and he was uh, born in Spokane uh, and lived most of his adult life in Washington. Um, but he, he started to really uh, hone his art. He took a Model T Ford with a couple of artist friends and barely made it to San Francisco um, and lived in low rent housing. Um, found a bookseller who sold, who would sell his art, had his first exhibition in San Francisco, very much influenced by uh, Thomas Hart Benton, also very much influenced by the Ashcan School, um, uh, became a ship's steward, got kicked off the ship for fighting, returned to, so I mean, I, I'm really loving this character, <laughs> returned to Seattle, um, and became really friendly with Toby and Morris and, and Gray, uh, Mark Toby, uh, Morris Graves, as well as Kinjiro Nomura and, and Kamakichi Tokita, uh, and others who were working in a sort of similar American scene, social realist type, uh, type style. Uh, and he was also the first curator at the Seattle Art Museum. <laughs> so a, sort of a Renaissance man, I, I, his character really appeals to me because I've got well, I never fought on ships, but some of those things in my character too. Um, at least you're not telling us. Considered... What? So at least you're not telling us that part about your biography. <laughs> yes. And he was he was associated with the mystics, but he never considered himself a mystic. He he always he said that his uh, his work was firmly rooted in nature and in art history, and I think this is the. Uh, Pike's Place Market. I don't know that. Do we know that, Margaret? Um, we don't know for sure, but that's what we're pretty we're pretty confident that it is. Yeah. I don't think he thought he was a mystic either, for that matter. But that's another lecture. Um, 
So, you know, you've been talking about American scene. Um, and so for me, you know, what I find interesting about American scene, when we're talking about that, of course, we're talking about this moment where um, there's this real interest and focus on um, scenes that really capture specifically American life and a lot of it rural. Um, and what I love about American scene work is how much it tries to sort of define what regions in America look like. Like, what's a characteristic? If you see a lighthouse, you know you're in New England or things like that. Um, so we have this amazing collection of prints that came to us. I mentioned her earlier, this woman named Carolyn Schneider, um, who had been collecting works um, from an organization called the Associated American Artists and amassed a collection of almost 400 of them and then gave them to the museum in um, the early 1970s. So can you talk a little bit about the Associated American Artists? Because you've got a really nice selection of those uh, pulled for the show too. Yeah, it's one of the lovely things that we were able to bring out because we don't often manage to get those out either. <clears throat> Associated American Artists was, um, was set up in, I think, 34 or 35, 1934 or 35. Um, and it was set up to um, basically give artists, and it included people like Thomas Hart Benton, um, a market during the Great Depression. Um, so Associated American Artists would pay George Schreiber or whoever it was uh, $200 for an edition of their prints, which the, then they would sell to the subscribers uh, uh, of uh, Associated American Artists for $5 a print or $7 for a frame print, which is, was a bargain then. And many art, many of the even more famous artists whose, who's, you know, rock star galleries weren't selling their work of art, works of art because it was a depression, broke their contracts with those galleries. And Thomas Hart Benton famously did this and went with Associated American Artists because at least there was going to be an income coming rather than hanging on wing and a prayer for a larger painting to be sold. Um, so a, a really important and, uh, uh, organization. And as American art changed and we, met, we began to move into abstraction, so the works of uh, the, the, American, uh, uh, the Associated American Artists sold to a wide range of people. They sold to the middle class. Um, who had, had never been able to uh, uh, buy art like this before um, and who all of a sudden had the possibility, despite it being during the Depression, of putting great good art in their homes. So um, I really, I've done a couple of shows on, on these on Associated American Artists, which by the way, only closed in 2000. So really quite recently. Um, and, and some of the works of art are absolutely astounding. You can still buy them um, with various galleries uh, uh, on, on online. And I love the I love the one on the left, George Schreiber, uh, this uh, oncoming uh, spring storm chasing uh, the landscape and the man on horseback um, who's fleeing from it. Um, and and it really shows you know this is Massachusetts. Uh, uh, he was uh, Schreiber was born in uh, in Belgium, but became an American citizen um, in the twenties, um, and uh, he was a summer summer neighbor of Thomas Hart Benton uh, on Martha's Vineyard, um, and so I just really love the the fine line uh, execution of this, and the slightly quixotic, uh, whimsical way that those clouds are chasing the landscape. Um, it's a beautiful print, I think. And yeah, then the sense of movement in it is amazing. Oh, yeah, that's why I love it. Yeah. And then the Thomas Nason, who's another uh, basically uh, self-taught artist. He grew up on a farm uh, in Massachusetts. Um, uh, after going to France in the war, he became friends with a wood engraver and traveled with the wood engraver basically was taught wood engraving by, by, by a wood, wood engraving friend. And his wood engravings, he did over 600 wood engravings during, during his career. One of his most famous jobs was to uh, illustrate Robert Frost's You Came To collection. Um, and again, it's a really poetic, it's a slightly more moody, it's a slightly more um, 
almost like uh, Samuel Palmer from England in the, in, the, in the 19th century, moody, romantic vision of the countryside. Uh, but again, beautiful and moving uh, works of art, which people could buy for $7 framed um, in the 30s. Yeah, I think that's really what's such an important point at the heart of this, in this moment in time for American art is that idea that 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 kind of impulse to try and democratize art and who had it and who could see it. You know, that's a that's a guiding principle for the federal art projects too. to make. That's why all the murals in schools and post offices and, you know, and groups like the Associated American Artists, that idea that an average person could have an artwork in their home and or see one every day going to the store or to their um, to their pl meeting place or something like that to a government office. Yeah. 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 And of course, the American scene wasn't a style, it was a group of different styles, but it was sort of lumped together because they all, in, to a greater or lesser extent, showed life in the city or, or life in the countryside, um, but in a realist type of way. Realism really did hold sway uh, in America through the 20s and 30s, despite there was another group um, whose initials were AAA, which was called the Abstract American Artists Group, who were beginning to build up steam uh, in, uh, in the uh, in the 30s um, and who trans, uh, uh, tra transcended that to become the New York School and other schools of, of pure abstraction uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 40s. Yeah, I'm going to um, go to our next, our last slide, because we were going to talk a bit about abstraction and the slow kind of arrival of it um, and the changeover. But I wanted to note one of the questions I saw um, in the chat is a quick one to answer while we're on Associated American Artists. And someone was asking about the edition sizes, like how many of each of these were made. Um, and it varied, but on average, there was an edition of 500, um, though I've seen some be a little bit less and some more, but that was general. I don't remember, I mean, not knowing who's on the call or um, the kind of uh, generational ages and all of those things, but I remember um, the record clubs where you used to be able to, you know, you get a catalog every month and you could choose um, what record you were going to get. And I love the idea that you could have had an art subscription and gotten the sort of catalog of prints you could choose from. Yeah, every like, month. Like, like in more recent times, you would have a CD or a vinyl, yeah. vinyl subscription and people would send you something every, every, every month. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about um, abstraction. And then there's at least one, I'm kind of bumping in and out of the chat. So I'm sure there's others, but there's one kind of more complicated question in the chat. So let's save ourselves a little time for that. But um, what about abstraction? So we, we've we been talking about this sort of um, very realistic looking work and yet these works are happening too. Well, yeah, they were. Um, and again, um, unfortunately the Pollock is there as a comparative illustration um, and we don't own it. Um, it was, it's, it's at the Norton Museum of Art, which I used to work at, but, uh, so, but, and it was a joy to work with, but people would stand in front of this Pollock and say, I hate abstract art. And I say, well, well, good, because you're not looking at it right now, because if you look at this thing, you can see birds, several birds, beaks, um, infinity symbols, eyes staring at you all sorts of things you can make out in this, just like you could in a, in a mirror uh, um, or whatever, um, or a, a other abstract artists. Now, Pollock was uh, a pupil of Thomas Hart Benton. Um, and you may say this, bears absolutely no uh, relationship to a Thomas Hart Benton. I would say, uh, yes, I agree, except there's this sort of Baroque all over treatment that you get in a lot of Thomas Hart Benton's work, uh, filling every inch of the canvas, um, uh, as well as as well as you do in this. And I mentioned that in America there was this group called Associated American Artists, uh, uh, Abstract American Artists uh, group that was started in uh, in about uh, uh, in about uh, 1933, and a lot of very important. Uh, uh, American artists like Susie Frelinghausen um, uh, were, were, were a part of that group. And their, their, their work was more often a version of uh, second period of cubism, what's called synthetic cubism, which where, the, where, where things were realist, where you could 
somewhat realist, you could recognize they were, they were, they were not totally abstract. They were still rooted in, uh, in realism. Uh, or often they were, a lot of them were hugely influenced by Kandinsky. Um, and that was in the 30s. But by the 40s, you had these New York school painters, of which Pollock is, you know, perhaps, but also Rothko and, and uh, 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 various others who, who were really working in a much more uh, non-objective. That's what I, when I look at something that doesn't have anything I can recognize it, I call it non-objective rather than abstract now. Um, a much more non-objective non style. And I, I think you'll see the Toby, though it's uh, uh, nine years later uh, than, the, uh, than the Pollock. Uh, by the way, Pollock was offered to uh, a contract with the uh, Associated American Artists to do prints for them. And I was just contemplating how his career might have been different if he'd have t taken them up on that. Uh, uh, on, on that offer. But anyway, nine years before the Mark Toby, but again, I see a lot of things going on in the Mark Toby, and I'm going to let Margaret talk about the Mark Toby. <laughs> trying to find my unmute button. Um, yeah, for me, I, I, first of all, I always have to say no photograph this painting ever does it justice. It's really subtle. And so you really have to see it in uh, real life. I know at least one of you, I've been kind of following some of the comments in the chat, and at least a few of you have been here to see the show. So I'd love to hear your sort of thoughts about it. But um, it's just a such an unusual piece and it's in a transition moment for him. Um, there's earlier work by Toby where um, he started out really looking more like the Pollock where there's just kind of layers upon layers of figures or maybe Parts, parts of a cityscape or things like that sort of layered on top of each other. And then he starts to kind of cover it over with the, the marks and um, things like that. And then finally kind of fully transitions into that white writing style. And this Northwest fantasy, fantasy piece sort of sits in the middle of that where you can, I can see a landscape in it. And when you're in front of it, I think you'll see some elements that suggest a sort of Northwest misty, kind of like right now where you can look at a view and you see the mountains and then the fog comes down a bit and it lifts again and the rain comes in. Um, but I think too, you could really look at it as a pure abstraction um, as well. But it's an interesting moment for Toby um, as he's sort of slowly letting go of uh, realism as well. Yeah, I was looking at a, um, a later piece by Kenneth Callahan, which had a different palette, it was much darker. Um, but had a similar type of abstraction uh, going on in it um, from about the same time. Well, I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing so I can see a bit better questions, but there, there was a great and sort of complicated question I saw in the chat. Um, so let me get to that for you, David, because it's a long one. Um, so the question is, is art in Mexico and Canada moving in parallel are those movements similar to or different from the movements in the USA? Of course, I'm thinking of Diego and Frida, as well as Emily Carr in Canada. Are there other artists to be noted in this regard? Well, I will say that Canada is not my strong point. <laughs> um, but I will say that um, what was happening in Mexico uh, was very different and that was part of why it was so important as an influence because um, after the revolution in Mexico those mural schemes um, and 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 then easel the same basic style as those mural schemes uh, absolutely took over um, and even uh, even um, Frida Kahlo uh, I don't think Frida Kahlo could have could have been produced in America. I think Frida Kahlo was a produce was a product of that hothouse socially and um, artistically, and also of of that tortured, twisted background that she had, which was very, very, very Mexican. Um, 
Uh, I know there are artists like Agnes Pelton and, and, and in America that in a sense mirror some of some of those personal uh, bits that we love about Frida Kahlo, the way that she looks at her own life and imagines how she dresses um, and, and how she presents herself. But I think it's totally, um, I think they're very, very different. And whereas the main influence from America to, to um, Mexico seems to have been in photography to me, because there were a lot of American photographers who went down to Mexico, um, people like Paul Strand, uh, for instance. But I think that I think those two cultures, although they did meet with with murals through the influence mainly of Diego Rivera, are really quite separate and different. Margaret, what do you think? And what do you think about Canada? Have you done any work on Canada? Yeah, I, I kind of agree and disagree on Mexico. I mean, I think part of the issue is that um, there tends to be this assumption in particularly in American art history that influence only flows from America to other countries and that, oh no, we didn't borrow from anyone else. That, that's sort of the narrative people like to carry forward. And, and really, of course, it's the opposite direction. And I know a lot of the artists of the 20s and 30s who were muralists, they were got interested in it and were completely relying on what was happening with um, the art after the uh, Mexican Revolution um, for their to get that idea of like art could be about this social problem, this political moment. They could be these large scale public artworks, you know, and that's very much an influence um, from Mexico. So yeah, I think it's an interesting sort of back and forth. There's an, an obvious exchange, a constant exchange that I don't think we all acknowledge of the backing and the backing and forthing. Um, it's true with the mystics to the Northwest mystics. People talk about them um, using influences from Asian art and affecting work that way. Well, they were picking that up from Asian artists. So we're here, you know, doing that work with them um, and giving them the influence. So it's an interesting sort of way about the, the narrative. I haven't done much with Canada. I mean, I, there, there's, I know little bits about the group of eight um, and uh, folks like that up there. And there's certainly that same sort of interest in um, letting go of realism and thinking about art in different ways. Um, but I don't know a great deal. I'm sorry about um, those groups in particular. Um, I'm not seeing, uh, does anybody else have other questions? Please put them in the Q and A or just in the chat um, while we're finishing up here, I but go ahead, David. I just wanted to add something if I could. I suppose one of the influences apart from actually making murals was the fact that the Mexican murals did focus on social uh, developments and and the scene in Mexico, um, uh, people around doing their daily lives. We also have that wonderful select, which we didn't mention, the selection of, of prints uh, from Mexico, from uh, Taya de Grafica Popular in Mexico City, a print workshop in Mexico City, which actually show people going about their daily lives and their daily activities. No, you're fine. I was just uh, giving people a chance to um, add other questions or comments in the chat. I'm just checking those right now. Um, but yeah, any final thoughts or comments, David? I think we're caught up with everybody. No, except to say that obviously, I mean, we've used two comparative illustrations because our collection is not, uh, the Tam's collection, although it's, it's wonderful and lovely and has some really great high points like I agree with whoever said that, that the Everett Shin was, was, was wonderful and that the Whistler, uh, that, that the uh, Ernest Lawson was beautiful. Um, but it doesn't have everything in it. Um, so it's, it's viewed through the lens of this museum. If, if Sam or Portland or whoever else were to do this show, it would, be it would look entirely different, although I think it would include many of the same names. Um, but we have to use we have to use the resources that we have. Um, you will see those uh, some of those comparative illustrations in the exhibition um, because I think it really helps uh, when you're looking at one. I mean, for instance, there's some nice early works by uh, John Sloan illustrated in the exhibition, and nice early works by uh, 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 George Loops illustrated in the exhibition, showing that Ashcan impulse. 
Um, but yeah, I, I just really was really happy to work with this and um, to get out of the uh, to get out of the director's seat and become a curator for a little while again. I'll be it for a short time. Thank you, Margaret. We had a question asking how the um, the prints, the Associated American Artists prints, were reproduced that made them so inexpensive. Um, well, when you when you set up a print, it's the same as if, as if you do a book today. If you do ten or ten ten copies, it's very it's very expensive. If you do t or or that's a bad. If you do a hundred copies or a thousand copies, it's expensive. If you do five thousand or ten thousand copies, it's it's a lot cheaper uh, to sell it per piece. Um, and I, it's, it's it's the same with 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 art prints. If you set up your press and done your plate, engraved it or etched it or whatever um, um, your your medium is, the main work is the the main work is obviously the etching and setting up the press. But actually, to run five hundred copies of a print may not take any longer than a couple of days. Um, so they can be sold. They can be sold cheaply, and of course, they were not paying. I, Two hundred dollars at that time was quite a lot of money. Um, but in terms of what people get for art today, I mean, what two hundred dollars was probably in today's terms, what maybe a couple of grand. I don't know. But but they they weren't getting them. They weren't they weren't they weren't giving the artists a lot of money, so they didn't have to make up all of that a lot of money either. But I think it's mainly that fairly long run, like you said, um, which every every one, every every extra edition, every extra copy, cuts down the price um, as as you produce them. I think that's why too you see um, if you look at the sort of medium. If you come to the show, there's this big yellow book sitting on the table that is a catalog of every Associated American artist print ever done, and it's thousands. Um, but you'll see one of the kind of common themes is techniques like etching um, or wood engraving, um, things that are they're, they're types of plates and printing surfaces that hold up under mass production better, um, that some of the techniques, like some of the plates, if you do a wood cut, um, it's the softer part of the wood. It can sometimes lose its definition more quickly, so you can't run as many copies. So you know that sort of varied by what they were doing, but they did tend to lean toward types of prints, um, silk screens too. Um, that whole idea that a silk screen could be an artwork, not just an industrial sort of way of making work, is something that comes out of this period, and um, you see a lot of those yeah. in the Associated American artists too. Yeah, yeah. Any last questions or comments? Pausing a moment for people to type. But um, well, if, if anyone's doing that, but thank you so much um, everyone for being here today for this. And we, we hope you'll come see the exhibition which is on view through the summer and um, join us for other talks and programs. Um, and thanks so much, David. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Sonny. Um, and thanks everybody for attending. Look forward to doing more like this. It's great. Great format. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.